a very good afternoon to all of you today we are going to discuss the uh, regarding of the uh, visual field this is one of the important uh, practical in the examination point of view uh, this is a uh, includes the penal uh, nerve two examination the optic nerve examination includes the visual acuity color vision field of vision another one is the uh, direct ophthalmoscopy or the indirect ophthalmoscopy to examine the fundus the perimetry perimetry is the recording of the visual fields is called as the perimetry today's uh, learning objectives for this session are you must able to know the what is a visual field what is a what are the different types of perimeters uh, you must know and what are the different types of perimeter which type uh, they work uh, either they belongs to kinetic or the static perimeters and the perimetry procedure and uh, you must know the doing the visual field estimation by using the priestley smith type of perimeter or uh, you can use by doing with the confrontation method uh, as a complete examination of the second cranial nerve or when you provided with the um, perimeter where you can examine with the priestley smith and priestley type of perimeter and you must know the what are the different factors which will affect the even the visual field also and what is the definition of visual field visual field of any eye is the portion of the external wall uh, visible to that eye when fixed at a fixed point uh, otherwise suppose if you are moving uh, the visual field is also change it is the field of of eye is the portion of the external world visible to that eye when it is a fixed to at a particular point theoretically it should be circular but actually it is uh, um, restricted on medially by the nose and by the roof uh, the superior orbital margin will restrict the field of vision uh, in the upper and the medially by the bridge of the nose uh, temporarily you have the 100 degrees so superiorly you have the 60 nasally also 60 and the inferiorly you have the 75 degrees and uh, so it is the Uh, and temporarily you have the more visual field and, and you compare and the latter the inferior and the uh, uh, both the nasal and the upper uh, because of restriction of the superior orbital margin and the bridge of the nose will restrict the visual field in the upper and the nasal a side the normal boundaries of the visual field suppose if you see superior 60 degrees the inferior 75 the nasal is 60 the temporal is the 100 degrees huh? these are the left and right eye huh? suppose if it is a binocular suppose if have the binocularly it is a 120 approximately it is a 120 degrees in the center huh? it is a approximately when you plotted to binocularly it is a approximately 120 and the boundaries of the both the left eye are superimposed uh, roughly circular but uh, some you will have the heart shape this is area is a binocular vision approximately 120 degrees on the side okay. now this is a single visual field uh, marking of the left eye this is the fixation point this is the uh, correspond to the 15 degrees to the horizontal it is the temporal uh, the, it is the blind spot uh. the perimeter shot on the field of vision of the left eye the red circle in this uh, indicates the blind spot these are the meridians the vertical lines what is uh, the meridians uh, they is marking the perimeter shot you having a uh, vertical meridians uh, at a uh, 15 degrees uh, you have the meridian these are all the circles of the isopters uh, you have 10 degrees isopters uh, from the point of fixation to the periphery up to the 90 degrees uh, the isopter is nothing but the points where the visual acuity is the same they have substance a same visual angle at the nodal point uh, uh, are represent as a uh, isopters uh, uh, even the uh, suppose we can see the threshold of the stimulus uh, the isopters are respond to the same threshold of stimulus uh, points in the isopters respond to the same the vertical is uh, the meridian of the and these are the circles round circle uh, are the isopters this is the uh, binocular visual field where the central area is uh, Uh, where it is have the uh, visual field uh, central uh, this is the individual eye that the dashed line is the left the solid line represented by the right eye and the central is the uh, represents the binocular visual field 
the central part of the visual field of the two eye coincides therefore any portion of uh, that uh, viewed with the binocular vision the impulse uh, uh, from the these uh, two retinas will be carried from this object fused at the cortical level uh, uh, perceive as a single image uh, the what are the suppose if you see any object in this uh, binocular field area the corresponding retinal points will be stimulated and uh, the corresponding retinal points will be stimulated and cortical uh, area perceive as a single image mm -hmm. the corresponding point what are the corresponding the points on the retina on which the image of the object must fall uh, if you see a, a single as a single object uh, these are the corresponding points suppose if i one i gently push it to align to uh, to some different uh, in these areas you perceive as a diplopia or the double vision suppose if the image on the retina that i displays uh, no longer falls on the corresponding point you perceive as a diplopia if the corresponding points are not falls you perceive as a diplopia then what is visual field is the mapping of the visual field is very important already when we discussed the uh, optic tracts its pathway regions we have discussed the homonomous and myopia and heterogeneous myopia and the macular quadrant canopia so already with macular sparing these are the we have seen uh, depending upon the type of lesion the vascular lesions or the pituitary adenomas compressing on the optic tract depending upon the type of compression we have uh, seen the different types of canopia uh, we have seen and it is important in the neurological diagnosis another condition was already when we discussed the glaucoma glaucoma is another disease where you do the the difference between the neurological lesions and the glaucoma the neurological lesions will be the vertical meridian and the horizontal the glaucoma will be the horizontal meridian that is the basic difference between the these type of lesions another condition Uh, night blindness is also produce the, the different types of visual because of the degeneration of retinal pigment epithelium and because of the, the and the and because of that it will affect the uh, retinal layer nerve fiber layers also where you see the, the night blindness even that is also is another condition where you do the visual field match, you know, mapping and so that uh, to see the any progression of the disease or whether the condition is stable or there is any progression of the disease also that is another condition where you use the visual field uh, mapping okay the peripheral portion of the visual fields are mapped with the instrument uh, called as the perimeter or the any perimeter is nothing but the Uh, the may, uh, instrument that used to map the visual field is a called as a perimetry the process of this uh, uh, is called as the perimetry uh, the instrument is the perimeter and the, the process is called the perimetry uh, whenever you are doing the uh, visual field see so you must be cover one eye and then you have to do a uniocularly like the visual acuity whenever you are doing the estimation of the visual acuity you have to do the uniocularly the perimetry also we have to do the uh, with the one eye the visual field is also another definition is the hill of island in the sea of, in a sea of darkness it is a hill of a, uh, island in a sea of darkness around it now yeah, this is the hill of vision uh, it is the part of environment that is visible to a yeah, steadily fixing eye yeah, that is most important it is a part of the environment that is a part of external environment visible to that eye yeah, and it is a, at a fixing eye point otherwise suppose if you are turning your eye right, it is not the because the field will be changing as you move the fixation point the deviation from the hill of normal you know, from the this thing is called as the uh, any field which is this is the point of the uh, uh, fovea centra also the fovea the highest uh, point of visual acuity this is the corresponds to the optic disc the, the where the optic nerve fibers are exiting this corresponds this is the corresponds to the physiological blind spot uh, this is the how this uh, hill of vision is uh, uh, is uh, coincide with corresponds to the distribution of the cones uh, even the a uh, distribution of the cones as the cones distribution periphery goes it decreases and it is a peak at the at the center fovea fovea central contains only the cones only where it has the highest uh, the sensitivity where uh, uh, the highest sensitivity usually uh, here we will see the, the 32 34 decibels uh, it compared as uh, it goes to the periphery it will decrease uh, okay 
the field of vision and the perimetry the path of external world visible to one eye and the person fixes the gaze on a point is called the field of vision and the process of charting this monocular uh, uh, with the perimetry is called the perimetry the field of vision is the visual scene area to so at a given nation the area seen on the nasal side is called the nasal field of vision the area seen on the uh, temporal side or lateral side is called as the uh, temporal field of the medial is the nasal side is the uh, called as the temporal field of vision by noting the location where the target appears and disappears the blind spot or any uh, scrotum muscles scrotum muscles are the non seeing areas the physiological scrotum the physiological is the blind spot is a example of the physiological scrotum and there are scrotum muscles are the absolute scrotum and relative scrotum suppose if the uh, in relative scrotum if you increase the threshold the intensity of light the, the scrotum will disappear but in absolute scrotum even if you do increase the light of in, uh, illumination also the optic illumination also it won't change okay the perimeters are two types one is the kinetic another one is the static the what we are using is the kinetic perimeters so that on screen the tan also called the tangent screen and another one is the lister perimeter and the other one is the priestly smith one uh, or, or the confrontation method is also example for the kinetic and the static is the automated or the freedman's is the uh, example for the what the available nowadays the advanced the most advanced uh, all the uh, people are using is the humphrey field analysis that is the most commonly used by mapach by the jais and there are so many other things are available but that is the most commonly used in the the two techniques we commonly employed is the one is the kinetic another one is the static in which the target moves across the field to map out the two dimensional extension in the kinetic it will map the two dimensional extension in the static it places the stimulus of the varying lumens at the same position at the same point it changes the different intensity of illumination will be changed and to determine the retinal sensitivity at that particular point it is adding a third dimension to the that point but uh, when you have a kinetic perimeter you don't uh, get the depth of the to get the hill of the vision you must uh, do the perimeter charting with the static perimeter with automated machines only and where you get the intensity of the uh, each point where you get the intensity of uh, uh, stimulus uh, intensity with the threshold where you get in a decibel point okay the, the perimeter the kinetic perimeter in this the stimulus of known luminous is moved to the periphery to to the center to establish the eye softness from the non seeing area to the seeing area from we move the object from the non seeing area to seeing area in kinetic perimeters where the known luminous uh, object is in the a uh, static perimeter the, the same point the, the illuminance uh, point uh, line illuminance will be changing the object illuminance will be changing from uh, from uh, different uh, illuminance the examples for the kinetic perimeter of the confrontation method the lister perimeter the tangent screen screen also called as a jerome screen and uh, boltzmann perimetry the static perimeter uh, in which uh, this involves the presenting a stimulus of a predetermined position at a particular point for a present uh, yeah, for a present duration with the varying luminance that is the static perimeter at a particular point uh, it will produce, uh, it will give uh, the area will be stimulated by the different varying luminance the friedman perimeter and the automated the humphrey field analysis are the examples for the static perimeters now, suppose if you see the difference between the kinetic and the it measures the extent of visual field by plotting the eye softness it measures the sensitivity of each retinal point in the static where you get the each point uh, the each point where you get the sensitivity in the static perimeter the stimulus moves from the non seeing area to seeing area here the stimulus is stationary but there is a increase in the luminance of the stimulus the result in, uh, depend upon the uh, operator experience suppose if the operator is inexperienced uh, the field so uh, plotting may be changing but it is a mostly automatic the role of operator is very minimal whenever you have the 
uh, non cooperative patients suppose if you have the more fixation losses so only when you are seeing from the monitor in the static perimeter where you have the monitor where eye tracking will be there where you can see the uh, how the subject is doing the perimeter is visible and only if the uh, false pulses and false negatives are uh, fixation losses are more when only then only we will interfere in the static perimeter but it is everything is operated by the operator will have to remove the object that is why it depends upon the experience of the operator the tangent screen confrontation method and the arc perimeters uh, uh, like the lister and the uh, smith lipis uh, meters are the examples of the arc perimeters uh, the static perimeters the uh, ridmans and the automated perimeters are the examples of uh the perimeter the when the tangent screen a small target is moved towards the central point the in a selected meridian uh, along the location where the targets become visible is plotted and the either in the degree of the arc away from the central point in the arc perimeter or the tangent screen the central visual field cells are mapped with the tangent screen sir in the tangent screen you have the different sizes suppose if you have the 1 meter tangent screen where the subject is sitting at a distance of 1 meter suppose you have the 2 meter tangent screen where the subject will sit at a distance of 2 uh, meters where you can map the only the central visual fields only uh, with a moving white target uh, this is a, a the uh, the tangent screen looks like and it is mapping will be done and uh, the subject the distance between the subject and the uh, depends upon the size of the suppose for this is for the 1 meter distance it is a 1 meter it is a point of fixation from where the the examiner brings the uh, different uh, objects from the non seeing area to seeing area following the particular meridian where they will they mark the the so this is the distance between suppose if it is because it is a 1 meter chart the distance between the subject and the, uh, the eye between the eye and the chart is 1 meter suppose if you use the 2 meters the distance between the Uh, germ screen and the tangent uh, germ screen also for the tangent screen where the distance will be 2 meters there are different object size 1 mm 3 mm 5 mm diameter objects are there different colors also also available to test the uh, visual field this is another uh, perimeter is a lister perimeter where you have the cell will be illumination so there is light system where you have the uh, and this is the chart keeping and this is a meridians and uh, this is a, a chin rest a adjustable rest uh, this is the art the stand with the object holder a source of light this is the source of light a adjustable chin rest and uh, spring lock will be available it is a metal arc and the chart marker will be uh, where you pin will be uh, will marking on the chart and the disc uh, chart plate holding the perimeter where you keep the chart on the this uh, chart holder and whenever the subject is uh, He says he uh, is able to see. Then you have to bring the closely the this chart holder to the screen. We will mark the on the different meridian. Okay, this is the this is perimeter. This is how the suppose if you do the perimeter charting, uh, you uh, this is a binocular visual field charting with this one. This is the Priestley Smith the uh, older version, and the nowadays you have the newer model where you have the object even the you can change the it is the object of the size of the object also in the you know, this is the chart holder and this is the arc of 330 mm radius of the arc and where you can this is the leveling bar this is the chin rest and this is the chart marking where you can mark the you have a leveling bar where you mark the different degrees on the depending on the subject identify the object okay this is another um, perimeter gold men's perimeter before the invention of the uh, uh, static perimeters the freemans and the automated vision this was the gold standard vision where you do the field of vision in the early okay this is the perimeter in the uh, patient view in the target present this is the perimeter regarding the uh, the chart on the other side okay This is the on the JIS one, the Humphrey field analyzer that is the most common. This is now the eye tracker. This you can adjust the. This is the uh, trigger, and this is the uh, where you can do the. This is the chin rest. Uh, whenever you are doing the visual field estimation, uh, here you have an advantage. Uh, you have you can use the refractive correction also when you are doing the perimetry charts with our regular meters. Where if you use the 
classes uh, where you have the peripheral uh, the, the periphery the uh, will be interfered by the rim of the lenses where here you have the uh, rimless uh, lenses will be present where you can keep the lens holder will be present that uh, won't interfere with the marking of the visual field uh -huh. okay this is how the this is a including and the, they are doing the with the lens shot where we can use the depending on the corrections where you will do the perimetry then what is the spitly priest is with the perimeter this is the perimeter what we are using the to do the charting of the visual field uh, before going to the procedure, we will know the uh, how the instrument, what are the different parts exist, having a vertical strand on which the metallic arc is pivoted. It also bears a circular black disc to, to read the meridian uh, which the metallic uh, arc is brought and the metallic arc, it is uh, a concave arc. Uh, with a semicircular uh, with a radius of 330 millimeters, the concavity faces the subject. The arc can be rotated in any direction and can be fixed at any position, uh, which it will help the by with the tightening of the screw. Uh, this is the arc of uh, 330 uh, millimeters, and we can fix the this one by the screw. Uh, suppose if you tighten the this screw, it will fix the arc in a particular position position and so that you can rotate the this arc and this is having a mark from the 0 to 90 degrees and uh, this also this uh, scaling also have the marking of the 0 to 90 and whenever you see the subject says the S yes, uh, we have to press the this button so that it will marks on the perimeter chart when rotate it describes the uh, uh, hollow sphere so that all the positions of the arc is equidistant from the retina the arc is graduated 0 to 90 degrees. The 0 being the at the center and 90, uh, the 90 is at the periphery. Uh, the 0 is at the center, 90 at the periphery. Uh, from fixation point 0, it is a 90 at the periphery. And the center of the arc, the, the, the point of pivot is occupied by fixation point, which is a white uh, circular. Part. So the, it is a fixation point where the pivoted, and that is a we use as a fixation point. I had asked the subject to fix that point. The subject is asked to fix the gaze in the white, but it's white in the field of the vision here in the map of the arc is uh, there's a mobile test object which is having a white color spot of 10 mm diameter painted on the circular disc. Nowadays, the uh, earlier only have the only one uh, the spot having a only 10 mm diameter. Now the latest models of the Priestley Smith uh, you have the you can change the size of the object, color of the object also with the mobile testing object. Okay, it can be moved along the length of the arm from its periphery to the center. Okay, we can move the from the periphery where you have the nowadays you have the plastic. Uh, so, uh, mobile uh, target where we have the where you can adjust the diameter of the object also and the color of the object also you can change in the business perimeter where you have the nowadays an adjustable chin rest and a detachable leveling bar is fixed in front of the metallic arc uh, this is a adjustable chin rest where you have a screw and this is a leveling bar uh, which is uh, used to so that uh, you uh, uh, it should have a occupy the same horizontal plane in the other way suppose if the subject uh, after keeping the chin uh, the chin rest suppose if he bends uh, the superior field will be be uh, will be decreased suppose if he moves up and the inferior field will be decreased because it is the position of the uh, of the uh, head also and the position of the eye also you must be take care so that uh, it won't, you won't get be affected by the recording of the visual field and the chin rest have the two chin cups uh, we have the right chin cup used to map the visual field of the left eye so left chin cup used for to map the right eye yeah? okay the chin rest is, a, is adjustable with the help of the leveling bar so that the central fixation point the tip of the leveling bar, the eye are at the same horizontal plane so that the visual axis, uh, axis will be coincided with the rotation of the eye. Okay, uh, the leveling bar used to level the so that uh, you have the this uh, fixation of the at the center point will be there, so that uh, it should not be at the same plane. 
the scale and the chart frame a circular chart frame to hold the chart paper in a position in provides the at the back uh, for the black circular this is the chart holder where you will provide uh, it is used to, you can open this go and fix the chart and such a way that uh, uh, the mark the chart okay to this the metallic graded scale is movable uh, pin punch point is fixed in the mark latitude of the perimeter chart okay and now he says uh, you can use this pin uh, you press and depending on the suppose if he says 30 you have to move at the 30 point and you have to press and Okay. The perimeter chart is the central point of the chart correspond to the visual axis. The concentric surface drawn at a atomic center is all, they are called as the isopters. Each concentric denotes the point of equal visual acuity, called as isopters. There are all the points on a particular concentric line subtend the same visual angle at the visual axis at the nodal point. Those are the isopters. The radius of the circle is marked at the 15 degrees interval, denotes the various meridians. Each meridian 15 degrees. We have the 50 degrees meridian from here 90, 75, 60, 45, uh, like the 15, 0, 15 again uh, comes to the 90. This is a hard, it marks as a 90. And these are the uh, meridians. Uh, the meridians uh, from here uh, 10, 20, 30, 40. Uh, these are the isopters. These are the meridians. These are the Isopters, uh, 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 this is the corresponds to the uh, what uh, the uh, blind, uh, this is the fixation point, and this corresponds to the uh, this corresponds uh, uh, the where you have to mark the uh, these things, and you have to mark the uh, uh, blind spot also. This is a chart. The uh, Priestley Smith is, uh, uh, is used for the ready, uh, where the chart is having a ready comparison, the normal limits of the field, and uh, both eye fields are drawn on the chart. A small oval dot marked as a horizontal median and the central fixation point represents the area of the uh, normal blind spot. Uh, the normal blind spot, this is the uh, normal uh, blind spot, is, uh, then this is the blind spot for the left eye, and this is the blind spot for the uh, right eye, this is the blind spot for the uh, left eye. The chart is attached on the back of the perimeter as it rotates in the arc. Uh, what that is the procedure how you do the Priestley Smith perimetry. Uh, place the perimeter on the table in a suitable height, see it in a such that the subject is sitting comfortably. Fix the chart in the frame. Ask the uh, him to place his chin on the chin rest and adjust the height of the uh, eye so that he is able to uh, fix the at the fixation point. His visual axis should be fixed the, at the fixation point. Instruct the subject to not to move his eyes and keeping at the fixation point. Otherwise, suppose if he is moving his eye, you don't get the correct field of vision. Then ask the subject to close the other with, uh, with the cuffed hand or otherwise you will have the occluder where you can tie the occluder to the opposite eye. Okay? The position of the arc uh, is on the zero meridian on, on the temporal side and fix the 5 mm white object on the carrier and take it to the end of the arc. Ask the subject to say yes as soon as he sees the object. Slowly move the object from the fixation point uh, towards the fixation point and suppose as the, if he says yes then strike the chart holder again is the pin so that it matches the chart okay and rotate the arc uh, downwards and upwards by 30 degrees take the object to the end of the arc and move it to the towards the fixation point when the object is visible mark the angle on the chart of the paper as before and you have to mark the every time uh, suppose if he is able to see says uh, at the 30 degrees, you, uh, you have to mark the, the chart point at the regular interval. Uh, suppose if he says, uh, this is the uh, where you have to mark the, like the, suppose if he says, uh, I will be visible at the 60 degrees at the, in the uh, meridian, you have to mark this one on the 60 meridian. Suppose he is able to, in the 30 degrees meridian, if he says, yes at the uh, 50 degrees, you have to mark the this meridians on the chart. Okay?
repeat the procedure after moving the arc uh, with 30 degrees until a uh, whole 360 degrees uh, is covered to mark the blind spot mark the uh, the position the arc is at the uh, 100 degrees meridian uh, that is the 10 degrees below the horizontal on the temple move the object from the periphery towards the center the subject will continue to see the object to up to 20 degrees then it will disappear again it will reappear after 50 5 degrees okay at the 15 degrees uh, where you will be normally having a blind spot is measuring what it is a oval shape and uh, particularly 7 degrees and horizontally uh, it is a 5 degrees uh, this is the blind spot particularly 7 degrees horizontally 5 degrees uh, mark the both points on the chart and a small circle around these points will mark the blind spot with the 5 degrees five. approximately it is average 5 to 6 diameters, but it is oval shape, so vertically 7 degrees and horizontally it is 5 degrees. It is situated 15 degrees lateral to the fixation point and it is a corresponding to the physiological points of the corresponding to the optic disc, the uh, uh, leaving of the optic nerve fibers from the eye. The plotting of the visual field uh, of the other eye also done in the similar manner. Record the peripheral field of vision one eye uh, with the green and the blue and the red objects. Uh, suppose the, it also, uh, you can to study the effect of the color of the object, uh, you can uh, use the green, blue and the red objects uh, so that uh, the white is having the maximum, suppose the white object is having the maximum field of vision followed by the blue, followed by red, followed by the green. Green is having the lowest. Remove the chart from the holder and join the, all the pin points with the pin, obtain the peripheral field of the both the fields. Note the common areas of the uh, both also you have to note them. Examine the entire field and additional mapping uh, when you are doing that. Bring the test object from the fixation point and the, all the meridians. Uh, uh, you have to note down the uh, disappearance and appearance and you have to uh, examine the total visual field. This will reveal the any scotomas. Uh, suppose if the patient is having, you can uh, note down the different scotomas in this field. Then, what are the uh, factors uh, uh, before uh, we see the uh, what are the factors which will affect the visual field? What are the some precautions whenever you are uh, regarding this uh, visual field? Uh, the procedure should be explained to the subject and instructed not to move the eye from the fixation. Suppose if the subject is uh, not fixing at the fixation points, uh, what are the visual fields you have done is that wrong. You don't get the exact map. Uh, what are the and it, you must have a adequate illumination should be provided. Suppose if you don't have the proper illumination also, it will affect the visual field. If the subject wearing the glasses, these should be removed as they may restrict the. Uh, but suppose in the Humphrey field and lens where you have the rim type lenses, where without having the uh, rim free lenses will be available, where you can keep the these uh, uh, rim free lenses on the holder that are also useful in the static perimeters in the Humphrey field. The healthy eye should be tested first. Suppose if you are the test the uh, abnormal line, the patient may not be comfortable. That is always test the healthy eye first, followed by that. Then what are the different factors that affect the visual field? The visual acuity. Suppose if the visual should be sufficient and able to subject to see the testing object clearly. Suppose if we don't have proper visual acuity, the visual acuity is poor, then uh, you cannot uh, record the visual field. The size of the object, though the visual field is better with the larger object, the standard subject uh, should uh, object should be used. The color of the object, the field is the widest for the white color, followed by the blue, followed by the red and green. In that order, the, the green is the object is having the smallest field. Brightness and the contrast, the adequate illumination is also, uh, and the uh, contrast of the uh, object also will affect the visual field. Suppose if you see this one, the white will have the more, followed by the blue, followed by red, followed by the uh, green, uh, that is the order of the effect of them. The perimeter chart, whenever you are in this perimeter chart, you have to write down the name, date, and uh, suppose if you are using a, uh, a different uh, chart, you can, uh, which of the chart you have done, you have to write, and the left, you can do the, with the you can use the other way when you are marking the 
right eye uh, left eye you have to and you have to mark all the points and the name and subject and uh, the sex of the subject also you have to mention and the uh, size of the object color of the object also you have to write and whether it is a uh, illumination and also whether the subject is a cooperator or not so you have to make suppose if it is not a cooperative patient where the where the subject uh, or the maybe sometimes the uh, parameters even in the uh, static parameter uh, static perimeter also suppose if the reliable parameters like the fixation losses false positives or the false negatives are not a uh, proper and you have to may require to repeat the whole field then another uh, Way of assessing the confrontation visual field. For this, uh, the first and foremost criteria, the uh, whoever is the examiner, he must have the normal visual field. And uh, the distance between the uh, subject and the examiner is uh, three feet or the one meter distance. Another precaution we must take: uh, the gaze, uh, the height of the, the visual axis of the both the subject should be match. Uh, should match. It is a rough test of comparing the person's visual field with the examiner's. Uh, Uh, on uh, okay the subject is at the, at the at the facing each other at a distance of 3 feet or the 1 meter distance and the testing the subject's left eye he placed the cuff of the right hand over the right eye and the, when the left eye he, he fixes his gaze on the examiner's right eye eh? while the examiner closes the left eye and the opposite eyes uh, you have to Uh, fix uh, the subject is instructed not to move his uh, eye in any direction uh, and the examiner then uh, holds out the right arm to its uh, full extent midway between himself and the subject or the subject to say yes whenever he is the uh, moving of the examiner finger if there is no movement uh, then the hand is moved and still kept in uh, and the finger is moved once again in this way the examiner compares the uh, his visual field with the that of the subject using this procedure the peripheral field is tested in the all the four quadrants temporal upper and the nasal and the, uh, all the four quadrant the subject eye is, uh, is tested again in a similar manner the normal the uh, the peripheral field of vision is extends beyond 90 in the temporal side and the 50 in the upper and the 55 on the nasal and the 65 downwards only grass changes in, in the visual field is the only you can test with the, this the limitation and another thing the examiner uh, visual field also must be normal then the scotomas are impossible to locate suppose if you then you have to suppose if you have any suspicion then you have to use the perimeters uh, uh, to test the perimetry and uh, whenever you are testing the for the color and these things uh, the refractive error should be corrected And but whenever we are using this field, you know, when we are using frames, whenever you do, so uh, you have the uh, peripheral field defects. Whenever you use this type of, this is the confrontation method. The examiner and the patient are sitting opposite, and this is how the uh, the opposite eye uh, are at the same visual axis, and you have to move the finger, and you must you know. Even sometimes you can use the object also. Uh, here the examiner is in the different size object. Instead of the fingers, yeah, and this is the, I uh, should be having there at the same level, and or you are doing the visual field by the confrontation method. Okay, we'll see the video of the. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The talk we take in the day to the nasal sixty, up sixty, and down seventy-five. On the average, it depends on the prominent, the eyes prominent or not, the bony configuration round. It may vary from one person to another. So, if this is the point of fixation, it extends temporarily 100 degrees, nasally 60, up 60, and down 70. Inside this area, everything is visible. Outside it, it's not visible. We can examine the field of vision by two methods: either kinetic perimetry or static perimetry. In kinetic perimetry, we get a target from the peripheral outside the seeing area, and we move toward the center. And we ask the patient when he see this target, the location he notice this target. This is in kinetic perimetry. On the other hand, in static perimetry. 
we get a fixed location and we present to this location a stimulus of different intensity bright light less bright light and less and less and ask the patient where when he can see it and if he doesn't see it so we determine the level at which the sensitivity of this location is so this is the difference between kinetic and static perimetry So in aesthetic perimetry, we, we know exactly the sensitivity of a certain location. While in kinetic perimetry, we get a moving target and ask the patient the location when he sees this target. So here, this is a kinetic perimetry. We get a variable location, asking the patient where he sees it. While in kinetic, we get a fixed location and we change the sensitivity. Kinetic perimetry is more efficient, more flexible in evaluating any part in the field, especially a peripheral field. It's more important in neurology and in pediatric conditions, but not in glaucoma. So in kinetic perimetry, we present target from the periphery in one meridia, asking the patient, when do he, does he see it? Then we go for another meridia, another meridia, and so on. Then we draw a line joining these points. We say this is the limits of the field of vision for this target, or what is known as isopter or a contour line. Isopter or a contour line is the limit of the field. It varies depending on the size of the target we are using and the color of the target we are using for this test. For example, here, this is the same person. If you put him in the on a parameter, and we start to make a drawing of the field using test object size five millimeters and its color white, then we get this at the limit of the field of vision. If the same person was tested again with another test object, the size instead of being five, it's now two millimeters and we draw the field. This is the limit of the field. Again, if we change the stimulus to half millimeter size and we draw the field and this will be the limit of the field. So the contour line or the isopter, it varies depending on the size of the test target we are using. It's written here, say, half millimeter white, this is the color, and 330 millimeter, this is the distance between the patient's eye and the perimeter itself. So we say this is the isopter. So this is the limit of the field when we were using five, using two, using half. This is a physiological phenomenon. The importance of this, if we are following a patient, we should use the same isopter for follow-up. Otherwise, you cannot compare different examinations. This variation depends on the anatomy. In the periphery of the retina, we get a receptors, a group of receptors, reaching one bipolar cell, another group to another one bipolar cell, and a third group to one bipolar, then a group of bipolar, say three, to reach one ganglion cell. If we go a little bit toward the center, we get smaller collection of receptors to one bipolar, another small collection to one bipolar, and say two bipolar, for example, to one ganglion. If you go to the fovea, you get one receptor to one bipolar, to one ganglion cell. In nerves, we know what's known as all or none rule. If you get the stimulus of this size, stimulating, say, seven, eight receptors. If you put it in the periphery, it will only stimulate seven, eight receptors, but it will not stimulate the whole group. So I wouldn't reach the target to fire an impulse in the nerve, in the ganglion cell. So the patient will not see it. If we go more central, the size of this stimulus is large enough to stimulate all these cones. So we reach the threshold to fire an impulse, then the patient will see it. If you get a very small stimulus, 
it will not be seen unless you go to the very central part. This is just because of the arrangement of the receptors, bipolar cells and the ganglion cells. Clinically, in the past, we used to check the central part of the field using the germ screen. Germ screen is a screen meter by meter. In this case, the patient will sit in front of it at a distance of one meter, or two meters by two meters, and the distance from the patient will be two meters. We get a point of fixation in the center, and we get different meridia. We get rings here. The central ring is five degrees from point of fixation, then 10 degrees from point of fixation, 20 degrees, and 30 degrees from point of fixation. The doctor will get target, different colors, different sizes, and start to move the target from the periphery to the center. Of course, one eye is covered, and the patient is asking, does he see this target all the time? Then the test is repeated in the different meridia. Imagine that our patient miss seeing the target from this location to the next one, but sees later. He can see it from the periphery here, but he miss it in this sector, then see it again, and so on. Then we will say that the patient got a defect in this area. A defect inside the field, we call it scotoma. So scotoma is an island of blindness inside the field of vision. Clinically, we say scotoma can be relative or absolute, or can be positive or negative. Absolute scotoma means that this area is defective for all sizes and all colors. Whenever we change the size or the color of the target, this, the same area is blind. While relative scotoma, it's an area that is blind to certain size or certain color. We call this a relative scotoma. Say in optic neuritis, you get a relative center scotoma for the red. In papilledema, you get a relative center scotoma for the blue. Positive or negative? Positive means that the patient is aware that there is a defect in, in his field of vision, like he get a corneal opacity or a cataract. He knows that there is a defect in front. But negative scotoma means that the defect is there and the patient is not aware of. Static perimetry gets several advantages. It's a repeatable. It can detect shallow scotomas. It get numbers, so we can use these numbers for statistical analysis. The disadvantage, they are inflexible. You always examine the same locations. Potentially a longer duration of test time, but now we get a rapid way to conduct the test in a quicker way. This is just a small video. The operator choose whatever program he needs. This is an old parameter. New generations get different display. Here, this is the printer where uh, at the end of the test, you can print out the results. The patient will put his chin, his chin here. And over this hole, there is a small camera that keep tracking the view of the patient's cornea. We ask the patient to fix in the middle of these four points. This is the location of the fovea. Then as you can see, when the test is conducted, you will see tiny spots. First, we ask the patient to look in the center here. But after that, we get stimulus of light, as it's shown here, coming from different locations. The duration of the stimulus is quite short, and the intensity of the stimulus varies from one time to another time to check the sensitivity of the retina in these different locations. In static perimetry, usually we use a special size on the average number three. But in advanced glaucoma, we need to change the size to a larger size. 
We get the central field and the peripheral field. The central field is the central 26 or 25, or in some sources, it's the central 30 degrees, and the rest is the peripheral field. The central part is very sensitive. Whenever we reduce the size or change the color, this area will see it. But in the periphery, if you get a small target or if you get different colors, it will be missed. So the central area or the central field is the central 25 or 30 degrees. The importance of this area is this small central area represented in the occipital cortex around 83%. So most of the receptors in the cortex is coming, receiving stimuli from the central field. Almost all pathological lesions will appear in the central field. We use the simplest one, uh, a sort of dynamic perimeter. Uh, perimeter first, uh, perimeter. Uh, it's a black arc with a point mm -hmm. of fixation in the center with the chin rest and uh, with a stick, a white point. White point, which will move from the periphery towards the center and ask the patient to recognize the moment when he will see the periphery, no, when he will see the movement yeah. of the subject. All the time, the patient will look into the white point in the center, its point of fixation. Mm -hmm. He will see this uh, white point uh, with his peripheral vision. Not clear, but when he will see movement, he should say, yes, I see. Speed of the stick, about 2-3 centimeters per second. Like, not like this, because in this case, you, you know, the patient's results will be very... One, yeah, uh, and not very slow, like two, three centimeters per second. On the uh, side uh, surface or in several perimeters here of the arc, you'll see um, degrees from the point of fixation 10, 20, 30, until the 90 degrees. When the patient will say, Yes, I see this white point, uh, according to the result, you see how many degrees and put it on the screen. It will be the result. Uh, when you measure in eight meridians, eight will be enough. What does mean eight main meridians? Eight, eight main directions. So, uh, superior border, inferior border, two lateral borders, nasal and temporal, and four oblique. For example, superior temporal, inferior nasal, superior nasal, inferior temporal. Four, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter from what direction of the arc you will start, it may be horizontal meridian, it may be vertical, it doesn't matter. Uh, also, we check both eyes separately. Before you will examine, during the credit and for your practice, before you will start, you should uh, draw such a simple picture. Main meridians. in the Glaucoma Research Center. Today I'm going to... Our cooperation is needed to obtain reliable results. The average test takes between three to six minutes for each eye. If you need to eat a snack or use the restroom before the exam begins, please do so. It is important that you remain focused during the entire exam. Each eye will be tested. Your chin and forehead will rest against the machine while you hold the response button in your dominant hand. If necessary, a corrective lens will be placed in front of your eye. 
this is the, the lens which you have in the module, which is the lens folder, the static perimeter. I. This position for a few minutes. Notify that the table in your hand when you see a flash of light. You will see a central target marked as a steady light inside a black hole. Or in other machines, this may be a green cross. The central target. Fed. But remember to focus on the central target, this is the, the results will not be accurate. The correct way to take the exam is by keeping your focus on the central target to look for the flashing lights that appear. Visual field confrontation. There are many different methods to do a visual field examination, but we feel the technique which is about to be described is well suited to identify visual field defects commonly seen in ophthalmic patients. As with any form of patient contact, it is essential that you have introduced yourself to the patient and that you have washed your hands beforehand. You should explain to the patient that you're going to carry out a simple examination to assess their peripheral vision and make sure they're happy to go ahead with this. Glasses should be removed prior to carrying out the examination as the rim of the glasses may create artificial visual field defects. Efforts should be made to carry out the assessment in a well-lit environment with neutral backgrounds which will not interfere with the targets being shown to the patient. Finally, it is essential that both parties are positioned correctly to carry out the examination appropriately. When carrying out a visual field examination, you are essentially comparing the patient's visual field to your own, and therefore correct positioning is essential. You can see here that the examiner's eye level is in fact way below that of the patient he is examining, and therefore it is very difficult to directly compare visual fields. Similarly here, the examiner is sat too far away from the patient and therefore it's difficult for him to present targets at the midpoint between himself and the patient. This is a much better setup with knees almost touching and eyes level. Let's now run through the various stages involved with assessing visual fields. The first of which is an assessment of any crude or gross visual field defects. Firstly, a straightforward question is asked such as, is any bit of my face missing? or two hands can be presented to try and detect any gross or obvious hemianopia. The patient is then asked to cover one eye and the examiner covers his eye directly opposite. The patient is instructed to look directly towards the examiner's open eye and fingers are presented in each quadrant and the patient is asked to report how many fingers are being demonstrated. When doing this, Try to imagine a cross going through the centre of the patient's pupil, thereby dividing the patient's visual field into four quadrants. You can then present fingers into each of the four quadrants and ask the patient to tell you how many he or she is seeing. It is essential that fingers are presented directly into each quadrant and not overlapping the meridia and thereby overlapping two quadrants. A quadrantinopia in either the quadrant above or below would give artificially false readings as a patient would still see fingers. Good. Every swap eyes. Look towards my open eye again. Tell me how many fingers. Two. Two. One. Two. Good. You change your eye. The next stage is designed to confirm any findings picked up in the last section or to try and establish whether or not any further visual field defects remain undetected. Ideally, this should be done with a white pin or white target and finer targets can be used to try and identify or elicit more subtle visual field defects. Again, this is done with the patient covering one eye and the examiner covering the opposite eye. The white target is then brought in from peripheral to central and a diagonal line aiming towards the patient's pupil. The patient is simply asked to report when they are able to see the white target or the white pin. If no white target is available for use, then the same process can be carried out using a wiggling finger brought in from peripheral to central. You see it? Good. Great. 
it is essential that whichever target is used is displayed midway between the patient and the examiner. Thereby, the examiner knows that he is comparing his own visual field to that of the patient. The final stage of the examination involves assessing the blind spot. and This is most commonly done using a red pin, as the central portion of the visual field is most sensitive to red light as opposed to white light. Again, this is done by the patient covering one eye and looking towards the examiner's opposite open eye. The red pin is first held centrally and is moved temporally as the blind spot is located 15 degrees temporal to fixation. The patient is asked to report when the red pin actually disappears and is then asked to report when it reappears. Again, the blind spot is mapped out in comparison with the examiner's own blind spot. An enlarged blind spot may be found in conditions such as optic nerve inflammation, i.e. optic neuritis, or optic nerve head swelling, as found in papilledema. Let's finish by watching the whole procedure from beginning to end. Okay, so again. You have to sit in front of the patient and there should be a distance of around 3 feet between the patient and the examiner and the eye level should be the same and uh, first grossly you can test the patient's binocular visual field by either by using the face as the target or by showing both hands. Can you see my face? Is it blurred anywhere? No. All right. Then, how many? How many? Ten. Look here, look here. How many? Ten. Okay. So after grossly checking the binocular visual field, you ask the patient to close one eye. And you have to close, the examiner has to close the corresponding eye. Then the patient's visual field is tested by showing the fingers Look here, look here. Yes. 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 So, after uniocular visual field examination, when you find some visual field abnormality, you have to uh, fine tune with the uh, red target. So, when you test red target, uh, you first ask the setup is the same. You ask the patient to close one eye and uh, and you will be closing your eye and you bring the red target. In the case of hemi okay, you will be bringing the red target from the periphery to the center. And in hemi if there is macular sparing, the patient will be able to see the red target. Um, and and again, the, the, you can test the central field also using the red target. The patient has to appreciate it as red. Red? Yes. Red? Yes. Red? For the work we need, the perimeter first, standard printed forms of the fields of vision, the mark with the different colors. Put the person under the test back to the light and ask her to put her chin into the horizontal support of the perimeter. Its height is regulated so that the upper body of the vertical part of the support is near the lower edge of the eye socket. 
put the arc of the perimeter into the horizontal zero position and start the measurement. Put the device with zero in the upper position. If you define the field of vision for the left eye, the person under the test puts the chin into the right part of the support and vice versa. The person under the test should close another eye with her hand. After this, she should fix her look on the center of the perimeter. The experimenter slowly moves the pointer with a white circle along the internal surface of the arc of the perimeter from 90 to 0 degrees. Ask the person under the test when she can see this circle with a fixed eye on the center of the perimeter. After this, repeat the measurement. Point the obtained results in the special blank. The same way, make the measuring from the opposite end of the arc. Repeat the measurement. Vision. Vision. Point the obtained results into the special blank. After determination of the side borders of the field of vision horizontally, turn the arc vertically and measure the highest and the lowest borders of the fields of vision. Repeat each measurement two times. Put the obtained data into the standard forms of the fields of vision. For more exact measurement of the field of vision, they recommend to make the investigation in 24 meridians with the 15 degrees interval. The measurement is made analogically. Connect the obtained points with the continuous line. This is the border of the achromatic field of vision.